Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. While you're turning, let me tell you where we are. We're in our series on mission, and most of you, I'm looking around the room, most, although we have some uh, guests of the band here tonight. I don't know how else to say that. Uh, but they're friends. They're longtime friends in ministry, so it's so good to see so many of you. Please don't rush off so I can say, hey, before you go. But we're laying the groundwork for what it means for us to be on mission together. How do we know, love, and obey Jesus together as a family? And uh, that's what this series has done for us. It's kind of the de facto first, forgive me, membership class of sorts as we gather together to worship the Lord. We started out with the reality of it being all about Jesus. And then we talked about a gospel doctrine and how important that is. And our gospel doctrine ought to create a gospel culture. And that's created in community. And it's not just transactional, it's a family. And now here we are today under the heading of gospel service. What does it mean to serve the Lord? Does the Bible give us any direction on that? Or can we just do whatever we feel like doing when we want to feel like doing it? As long as it's for Jesus, what does it matter, right? Hey, just me and Jesus, we're cool, right? We got it all together. Does the Bible give us any direction? It does, in fact. And while I had set out to probably cover some specifics of serving in Mission Bible Church, I, I've got to bow to the text. And the reality is this is one of the most powerful passages that I've seen to address service in this way, and, and yet it, uh, it deals more with the heart behind the servant than it does the actual acts of service, and it matters. How many of you have employees that you work alongside in the workplace that you know hate every moment that they're at work? And you don't have to raise your hands, it's okay. I did my hand like that, don't do that, you might be seen on camera. And uh, not only do they hate every moment they're at work, they let everybody know they hate every moment they're at work, right? These people just, they've got the spiritual gift of criticism, and they always seem to have a word. Yes? No? Unfortunately, I've seen that in the church. People complain sometimes and murmur, and the Bible addresses that. It's a heart issue. It's not a job or a task issue. It's a heart issue. We should live our lives to serve the Lord with gladness as we serve one another faithfully. That's really the sermon. We should live our lives to serve the Lord with gladness as we serve one another faithfully, ready for Christ's soon return. That's the text that Lance just read for us, and we're going to dive in. God's word today, this morning, I believe will give us not only the motivation and the manner, but the means that we are to serve as a church family. Take your Bibles and look with me uh, at verse 11 and, and maybe write this down in your notes. By the way, all of the notes are online and so they're right there attached to the sermon and they're connected to the live stream if you're watching on the church website at missionbiblechurch.org. But I'm gonna start with verse 11. I'm breaking a homiletic rule. I've got Brother Stephen with me. He's taking notes on my homiletics. That's a fancy word for how we preach preachy things. It's just preachy words, right? But I'm going to break the rule and start with the last verse first, and that'll drive some of you crazy. I promise I'll hit all the rest. But I want you to notice in verse 11, at the second part of that, it says, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. The first thing I'd have you write down, your first note, is why we serve. And the rest of that would be why we serve matters. Why we do what we do for Jesus matters. It matters because Jesus didn't come just to put us as workers in an assembly line for his service. He came to save all of us, not be a part of our lives. He wants all of us. And so why we do what we do matters. And verse 11 says, it's all for the glory of God. If you're taking notes, there's a subnote under point one. We serve, we are motivated by God's glory. You see it in verse 11. Now part of, if you've ever been catechized, and that's not a surgical procedure, although it may have felt like it when you were memorizing it. But if some of you were raised catechized, and you learned certain truths, succinct truths revealed to us in God's word, you may have learned a version of this 
uh, on, we exist to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Not only do we exist to glorify God and enjoy him forever, we serve out of that same heart. God is glorified as he works in his people and he works through his people and you will never be more satisfied in life than when God is working through you and he's getting all the credit. You see, it's important to note there in the text, verse 11, it says that God may be glorified. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. And I would say to the American church culture that we're confronted with on a regular basis, it does not say to you belong glory and dominion or to your pastor belongs glory and dominion. We're not trying to create a brand awareness here. We're trying to advance the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means it's okay for you to be out at the coffee shop or in your place of business, wherever you are, sharing Jesus, and you forget to mention the name Mission Bible Church. You've mentioned the most important name if you get to Jesus. Amen? Let let them get in a Bible preaching church. I'm, I'm happy about that. When we talk about God's glory, though, I'm mindful that we can think that means a lot of things because there are a lot of things that say, well, that glorified God or this glorified God. God's glory is defined as the splendor and brilliant beauty that shines through all of his attributes. That's wordy. For the young people in the room, let me say it this way. Um, Wetness is to water as glory is to God. You kind of can't separate it. Like water's wet. Does water ever lose its wetness? No. How do you know it's wet? Because it's water. How do you know you've been around water? Because I'm wet. Right? You got it? You see what I'm doing there? And and that's what God's glory is. It's just what radiates from him. It's the manifestation of his perfectness. The doctrine of the glory of God talks about his greatness and his splendor and his holiness. In the Old Testament, there's pictures of him robing himself in glory. There's pictures of him manifesting his glory through creation displaying his glory. And then the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, if you want to make a little note, I don't have time to chase this tonight, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul's talking to the Corinth church. We've already addressed like why we're not called Corinth Bible Church. God help us. It's one of the, wow, you talk about a messed up church. But I'm so thankful that Paul wrote to them so tenderly, directly, but tenderly and lovingly, it teaches us how to pastor well too. But in the church at Corinth, Paul is talking to those and says, those of you that are holding the Old Testament, the Old Covenant in your hand, and you refuse to see Christ as the Messiah, you have a veil on you that's thicker than the veil Moses had on his face when he came down from the mountain. And and when you come to see Christ as the Messiah, that veil will be removed and the glory of God will shine on you. How? Through an emotion, through a feeling, You stick your finger in an electrical socket and feel something. No, no, no. How will it shine on you? You'll see Christ as the Messiah. God's glory is most brilliantly displayed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says of Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. Now, I'm not, I don't want to say something the Bible doesn't say here, but it's like the three of them had a meeting and said, This is the best representation of who we are. Let's put flesh on love and the word and let him live and dwell among men. And Jesus Christ, the preexistent, virgin-born, sinless, spotless, perfect God-man who dwelt among humanity in whom God was. It's all about Jesus. We serve in the church. We serve one another Because God is glorified when we do. He shows off his attributes when we decrease and say yes to him and serve one another. There's another reason right in our text. I'm breaking so many homiletic rules tonight, but I don't need to tell you that anymore because it doesn't matter. You just act like this is normal. Now let's go back to the first verse and look at another reason, another motivation as to why we serve. Seven, first part of seven, it says, the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. So we see the glory of God as a motivation, and we're also motivated by the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, when I say Jesus is coming back, I know some of your church history and heritage. Some. I can't wait to learn more of your church history and heritage. But I wasn't raised in a Christian home. You know this about me. But my grandmother would take me to a wonderful church that had an Awana program. Shout out to Awana. Hashtag Awana for life, right? But they had a great Awana program. And we, uh, that's where the gospel was sown into my life. But this church and, and other churches of that time and era in the 80s and 90s, everybody seemed to be screaming fearfully that Christ was coming back. And they were trying to scare us to Jesus. Like, When we heard Jesus was coming back, it was like, oh, no. That was the response. Christ is coming back soon. And you heard people, oh, you could hear people say, oh, God, help us. And I'm like, oh, like it's, oh, I didn't know whether to be scared. I'd grab my grandmother's hand. And I was 16. Just kidding. Making that up. When we hear that Christ is coming back, if you spend time in this word, you will see that that is not a reason for fear or dread for the believer. That. That's not the motivator here. Fear and guilt are terrible motivators for action. No, for the believer, we understand that one day soon, and Peter knew this well, the Holy Spirit had him recorded. The Bible declares to us that soon, and very soon, I believe, the King of glory is coming back to this earth to set right all that is wrong. Jesus is coming back. The king is coming to unite his church in glorious victory over all the enemies of Christ from all the ages to rule and reign with him forever and will have no more sin or sorrow. Our sin nature will be gone. You won't have to deal with your worst enemy. And it's not Satan, it's you. (laughs) That sin nature will be gone. We will rule and reign with Jesus for all eternity. The lover of our souls, John, in Revelation, after seeing all that he could see, said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Why? To pour out the bowls of wrath? No, because the lover of his soul was coming to set all things right. When we hear Christ is coming back, it ought to motivate us to faithfulness because we can't believe that he's given us the opportunity to serve him in this capacity. Another big Bible word for you here is eschatology. Eschatology, theological word. It means the study of, well, what Peter said, the end of all things is at hand. Peter here is dipping into eschatology a bit. It's the belief of end things or the the doctrine of last things. Can I tell you that a gospel-centered view of the end times will drive us to faithfulness not fanaticism. A gospel-centered view of the end times will be more about Jesus than the Antichrist. A gospel-centered view of the end times will have us excited and serving, not fearful and hiding. Amen? We serve because God is glorified in and through us. And that just blows my mind. We serve because Jesus is coming back. So if that's our motivation, what's the manner in which we serve? Do you know that how you serve matters? For every parent in the room, I'm not picking on any young person here because it's been a minute, but I was one too. But for every parent in the room, you and I both know there's a difference between obedience. (sighs) Yes, I'll do it. Right? Right? Nobody feels me on that. And yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. And we do it. Nobody? Just our family then. Okay. So there's a difference between joyful obedience and obedience that scares you a little bit as a parent, like they're going to burn the place down after they do it. No? Just us? Okay. So I heard somebody say preach. There you go. But how we obey and how we serve matters. Number two, I would write that down, how we serve. And the verses we're going to look at are verses 7 through 9. So he says the end of all things is near. And then he gives us some direction on how we should serve. Let's look at the text together. Verse 9, or verse 7 rather. It says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another Without grumbling. I'm going to touch on all of these things under point two. Three points tonight, a few sub points. Thank you for putting up with me. So, how do we serve? Here's your first summary point of that first thing. We serve with disciplined 
prayerful lives. Verse 7, disciplined prayerful lives. What does it mean to be self-controlled? Well, that's disciplined outwardly. Self-controlled. It's a fruit of the Spirit, we know that. But in 1 Timothy 4, the Bible tells us, have nothing to do with irreverent and silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. While bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hopes set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. The point here is we discipline ourselves outwardly. We live self-controlled lives. We don't act like those who have no hope. We don't spend like those who are outside the family of God. We are not consumed with anything that would get in the way of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are self-controlled. As I was reading that verse, I remember the King James, bodily exercise profiteth little. The pastor that led me to Jesus said that was his second life verse, and he thought biblical proof as to why he shouldn't exercise. I'll let you process that. He's in glory now, so it doesn't matter. Amen. Sober-minded was the second thing it said. So if, if self-controlled is our outward discipline, sober-minded is our inward discipline. Some of you are already there in Ephesians 5, thinking in your minds. It says, don't, uh, or rather look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, But understand what the will of the Lord is and do not get drunk with wine, that's debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Discipline yourself inwardly. Say, yes, Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, your reasonable act of worship. So how do we discipline our minds? I'm glad you asked. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I've said it until I'm blue in the face since I've been preaching in pulpits. Get in the word so the word can get into you. You won't know how to be self-controlled and sober-minded. You will not come to that conclusion on your own. Your flesh will resist that. That's what it does, and it's really good at it. How did you come to that mind? How do you come to that being filled with the Holy Spirit? You get into the very word of God and let his spirit feed you on the word of life. This passage connects those mannerisms to our prayer life. I said disciplined prayer life. Some of us think that the only thing our prayer life needs is more praying or another workshop on prayer or another book on prayer. No, God's word clearly indicates a connection that our living... And our thinking impact how effective our praying is. How you allow the Spirit to lead you, how you allow God's Word to get into your mind will directly impact whether your effective, fervent prayers avail much. How else do we Serve. What's the manner in which we serve? If you look at verse 8, it says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sin. If our first priority is Godward in our praying, then our second one is toward one another in the quality of our love. How do we do it? Here's the word. Ready? With genuine, forgiving love. How do you serve? I thought you were going to tell us, like, we need sound people. We need deacons. We need elders. Yeah, I'll get to all that. That'll take me about 45 seconds at the end. Well, nothing takes me 45 seconds. Erilyn should probably amen that. I think my wife just amened. Um, But I'm going to deal with that in just a minute. But I'm telling you, if you look in the Bible, the Bible gives so much more ink to our hearts and the posture of our service than what it is that we do. Genuine forgiving love. Jesus said a new commandment. I leave with you that you love one another. Wow. Just as I have loved you, you're to love one another. By this doctrine, no. 
By this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Jesus said in John 15, this is my commandment that you love one another. Greater love is no one than this than someone lay down his life for his friend. Romans 12, 9, let love be genuine. You know how to know if love's the real thing? It's forgiving. Love is laced with forgiveness. Love should be laced with forgiveness. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that kind of family? Who wouldn't want to be a part of that kind of loving church body? During the height of the civil rights movement in this country, many African Americans inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. engaged in a non-violent demonstration. They engaged in several, but one of the most notable ones was when they marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. Non-violent demonstrations in the face of it will turn your stomach to see the violence and hatred spewed at people, fellow image bearers. It should turn your stomach. And the whole nation for the first time was forced to reckon because it was broadcast on television with what they were seeing because there are a lot of lies being told about some of these things. And the truth was right in front of them. The ones that were nonviolent and the ones that were violent didn't fit the narrative they had heard. In fact, it was a powerful witness of folks refusing to repay evil with evil. They were choosing just to try to love and to walk as a group. Not all who participated were Christians. I'm not holding them up as a righteous standard. Here's what I'm saying, though. If a civil rights demonstration can demonstrate that type of love laced with forgiveness, what's our issue as the church of the living God? Nobody should outlove us. Nobody should outforgive us. The church is to be a place of that kind of love in the face of evil and hatred of a world that's growing increasingly hostile toward the body of Christ that we still hold tight to one another still sing the songs of Zion and march on for the Lord Jesus Christ. The last thing under how we serve matters, I don't want to linger here too much longer, but I would say in verse 9, with joyful open hands. Joyful open hands. How do you get that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. I promise I don't talk to myself that often, but it's fun when I'm preaching. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. One of the most overlooked qualities that's required of elders and deacons, but especially of elders, one of the most overlooked qualities is that they are required to be hospitable. Both in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, hospitable is listed as an essential component for those God is raising up to serve the church in leadership positions. Hospitality is how we put our love into action. Hospitality is how we come open-handed to those around us. Now, hospitality among Christians is an important and tangible expression of love. But did you know that in the first century, hospitality, I mean, they were like the South. Seriously, they were like the Southeastern part of the United States. Um, I won't say names in case somebody from Idaho Falls is watching Aaron. I won't say your name, Aaron. But a dear brother was sharing with me earlier that in the place where he lives, a nameless part of the country... Um, that, see, was that okay? All right. Um, That when he and his wife opened their home so that people could come in, they kind of got funny looks. They're like, what do you mean you're opening your home to us? What does that mean? It was a disconnect because that's not normal everywhere. It was normal a long time ago in the nation, but that's not a normal thing, opening up your home for a bunch of strangers to come in and have a Bible study group or have food or and it not be Thanksgiving. It's kind of weird. It wasn't weird in the first century. But here's what was unusual. People would do it for strangers because there weren't hotels. Marriott, not yet uh, a family of hotels yet. Just didn't exist, all right? So people would go, and they'd be on a long journey, and they'd run out of daylight, and they'd knock on a door, and they would open their homes to strangers and say, yes, you can sleep on the living room floor. There's a basin of water in that area. We're going to bed please be gone by breakfast. I don't know what they would say. But then they would go upstairs and apparently complain the whole night. 
Can you believe these people came in at 11.55? The game was almost over and I missed the last four minutes of the game. Can you, what happened? What is going on? Apparently that was normal too. Hospitality with murmuring. And here God is doing what God does, telling us, don't be like the world. You open your hands and you do it with joy because I opened my hands to you. Freely you've received, so freely you give. To whom much is given, much is required. All of these are thundering around. We're to have a, an attitude and a demeanor of being hospitable to people and without grumbling. You don't have to have a lot. You don't have to have a lot to be hospitable. You see, in America, we turn hospitality into entertaining. That's not what hospitality is. Entertaining means come to my uh, museum, I mean home, and look at all of my things. Don't touch anything. Uh, and let me walk you around and show you all of my things. And you adjust to my way of life. Hospitality is the kind of place you, can, you don't want to leave. That's the difference. You go to somebody's home and they're like, man, we're so glad you're here. I know you don't like such and such, so we fix this. For those of us with a few food sensitivities, we're like, yes, we can eat. This is wonderful. Hospitality is centered on the guest. Entertainment centers on the host. Hospitality is not just having a meal. It's just being open-handed for the sake of love. What if we served in this manner? What if why we serve came from a heart that longed to glorify God? What if why we serve was because we were thrilled to have an opportunity in light of Christ's return? What if the way that we serve came out of us being prayer warriors, living disciplined lives that we didn't let anything get in the way of our praying? What if the way that we served overflowed with a heart of love? What if the way we served expressed itself with joyful, generous, open hands? And now the text takes us to how we serve or what we do rather. And I would give you the third point tonight. What we do matters. What we do matters. If why we serve is the motivation and how we serve is the manner, then what we do is the means. And it's actually quite short. Some of you are looking at your watches, I know, and saying, if he does as long on this one, we're going to miss pregame. None of you are watching pregame anyway. You're just waiting, right? You're just waiting on the certain commercials. Some of you are literally just going home to watch commercials tonight. I want you to process that. Process that. 1 Peter 4. Verses 10 and 11. Look with me. It says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God, and whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. I don't know which academic classes you were in in elementary, but I want you to know God calls you gifted. I see that witness back there. God calls you gifted. My grandmother loves telling my wife every single time we're at our house. <clears throat> Did you know Chad was in gifted classes? <clears throat> now, my wife has not shared with my grandmother that she knows how the testing rubrics were completely off in public school versus private school. And I was just, I was learning age appropriate stuff in Christian school. And then when I got into public school at, the, at that particular time, they were just about two years behind us. So I looked like a genius. Then when all that caught up with me, <clears throat> it caught up with me hard. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there a little bit. I got saved in 10th grade, and that changed things. But you've been gifted for service. Every one of us, the Bible teaches, have been gifted for service. We joyfully and generously serve. I want you to notice in verse 10, we all have a gift to serve. Everyone has received at least one gift. The Bible teaches that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. These gifts come from God. You don't work these up. The Bible teaches that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They are for the good of the body. They're not for your gratification or your glory. The Bible teaches that all throughout the New Testament. Newsflash, it's not about you for your glory and your fame. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. If in verse 10 we see that we have a gift to serve, in verse 11... I want you to hang with me for a moment. I think we see in verse 11 a hint at the types of gifts given to the body. You say, it's, uh, is he about to go through all of the gifts? No, I'm not, because depending on who you read, there are 15 to 20 gifts given in the New Testament. I, I want to talk about them in two categories that I think are, are kind of laid out for us here in verse 11. Look at verse 11 with me again. It says, whoever, <clears throat> whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. And whoever serves 
as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. I think you see the two categories here of leading gifts and serving gifts. One's not more important than the other. They both go together and all 15 and 20 have to work together for God's church to be what it ought to be. Got it? But the two categories here, and I just want to address them briefly. The word there for speaks, laleo, deals with a telling, a proclaiming, a heralding. So not all leadership gifts are speaking gifts, but all leadership gifts are communicating and directional. All leadership gifts are. And so some are gifted in certain ways by the Holy Spirit. It's not just that they're good communicators or they're good at their secular job. So man, he'd make a great pastor. Please stop doing that. It's that God has gifted certain people certain ways to serve in certain capacities in the church. But God has gifted all of us to serve in various capacities of the church. Some serve in leadership, not because they're special, because God is. And some serve in serving capacities. Diakoneo is the word there. It's used to indicate gifts that are not in front or out front, but are undergirding so that everything works. One's not more important than the other. One person who has this gift is not more important than that person. We are taught to long for if you had to pick a gift, if it was yours to pick, Paul says tongue in cheek, why would you pick a lesser gift and not pick a gift that explained the word of God? Paul makes a point there. So I'll concede that the preaching may be an elevated gift. I'll concede that based on text. But it doesn't make the preacher more important than the non-preacher. I won't concede that. We're all the same. We stand same at the foot of the cross. What the Bible never commands us to do is to discover our gifts. Hang with me. I'm not about to bash spiritual gifts test. That's not where I'm going. I'm afraid we make so much of spiritual gifts tests sometimes that we feel like that's Bible, but the Bible doesn't give us direction to discover our gifts. It's weird, though, because it gives us direction to use our gifts. So how do you find out what your gift is? Anybody ever struggle with that? I'm just, can we do that for a moment? Maybe it was early in your Christian walk, maybe right now, but at some point in your life, you're struggling. You said, Pastor, I struggled to find out what my gift was. Just show of hands. I want people to be encouraged. They're not alone. Praise God. For those of you watching online, hundreds of hands just went up. All just kidding. We've all struggled. How do you get there? I'm not going to give you a spiritual gifts test, but can I give you some guidance that I think will help you? The first thing I would ask you to do is to um, think about what you desire. What are you desiring? What are you interested in doing? What area of service? But when you think about that, What are the areas that you desire to serve in? Second thing is counsel. What do other godly men and women who are using their gifts say about you? What do mature believers think you are well fitted to do? I didn't ask what your crew in your chat group says that like to blow you up because you're awesome. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that know Jesus, walk with Jesus, love Jesus, if use Jesus and say, you know what I think you'd be great at? Listen to those people. Involvement. What do others who know me well say and think? And if I dove in to serve with glad hearts, where would I dive in first? <clears throat> Get involved. Do something. There's not a spiritual gift to clean the toilets. I looked. It's not named that. But guess what's got to be done? I'm not recruiting for that tonight. I'm just saying, like, there's some things. Chad, uh, Pastor Chad asked me to stuff envelopes. That's not my gift, right? No, wrong. We got to stuff envelopes. That's something we have to do sometimes. <clears throat> but get involved. See what lights you up. Serve with glad hearts and see where a fit is. If you don't like children, I mean, you should love children because God loves kids. But if you can't stand to be around them, we're probably not going to ask you to watch the nursery. Right? <clears throat> we don't need help that bad. It's better to have nobody serving than the wrong person serving. Do you understand that? That makes a lot of sense. Lastly, observe. Uh, what happens when I serve? Am I getting puffed up because I'm getting to serve? That may not be your gift. Is Jesus being exalted as I serve in this way? 
ah, you might be onto something. Here's the thing, though. Take your time. That's not one Sunday I said hello to people and it didn't go well. No, that's, it takes time to discover our gifts. I think that's helpful counsel for all of us as we try to discover our gifts. <clears throat> Years ago, uh, a popular ministry that was well known around the world was regularly getting mail. This is when people wrote letters and they were writing letters to the host of the TV program and they were saying to him, listen, uh, God's calling me to be the co-host of your TV program. What? What's that now? God told me I'm going to preach and take over your ministry. This has actually happened. One of my friends worked for this international ministry and uh, the kind of the owner, the president came out in there and it was just he, those two in the in the lobby one day, and he said, Brother Don, I need you to pray that God would stop speaking to people and telling him they're supposed to be preachers and TV hosts to take over the ministry. I need you to pray and ask God that he'd start calling janitors and folks to answer the phone. We got enough preachers around here to save the world three times over. I need people who will work, not who just want to be in front of the camera. Now, he said that tongue-in-cheek, knowing that God was not calling those people to take over. God wants us to serve. And he's got a lane for each of us to serve in. We're going to serve one another. How we serve matters. Why we serve matters. <clears throat> and God has given you the gift that you need to serve the Lord with gladness. Can I speak very quickly on something that's specific to Mission Bible Church? You've heard it said before, <clears throat> all of us have time, talent, and what's the third one? Treasure. Somebody whispered it because nobody likes to say that in church, but it's okay. You can say it. God knows. Time, talent, and treasure. And, and, and we're going to serve one another, and we're going to serve one another well. With our time, I want you to know that God gives us everything that we need to do His work. We all have the same 24 hours in the day, thank you so much, that uh, everybody else has, and God is enabling us to serve with our time. Did you know there are ways right now that you can serve Mission Bible with your time? Excuse me for just a moment. You can serve Mission Bible with your time. Some of you are showing up at 320 to serve with your time. You're serving in prayer. If that's not you, that's not an indictment against you. That's just one way. Um, get here a few minutes earlier. Stay a few minutes later. Even today, you'll still make it home in time, I promise. Stay a few minutes later. Connect with one person. I saw a funny video online the other day. This person said, um, I, I'm upset because nobody will connect with, I feel disconnected at church. And then it said, also me. And they sing the last song of, amen, God bless you. And the person runs out of their seat and runs all the way to their car and leaves the church and gets out and won't say or look at anybody and is gone and home while they're still like barely dismissing at church. So don't get here late, leave early, and then say you feel disconnected. You can serve God with your time. In the future, there'll be opportunities to go on mission trips. That's a way we can invest our time and go serve in our communities and serve one another. Be the first to sign up. Serve God with your time. Be here. Plan to be a part of what God's doing. Your talent, that's your gift we talk about. One of the ways that you can serve with your talent now, <clears throat> we can use help right now in guest services. We had the lovely Troutman girls uh, greeting some of you as you came in on the porch this, mor uh, this afternoon. They were a blessing. Some of you can, and can be a greeter. Now, if you're socially, uh, you just can't stand to be around people. And the greatest thing about Sundays is when you get to leave, that may not be a fit for you, okay? But some of you could serve and just welcome people here, that hospitality that we need. Some of you have probably run sound before. Or you've operated a knob before. I think if you've turned your radio up or down, we can train you to run the sound board here. We don't have a full band. This is the fullest we've had, it's two instruments and a vocal. We can handle it, right? We can show you how to do that. We can use your help. Uh, some of you have some skills on camera and editing. We can use your help. Uh, with the live stream. It's minimal touch, but there's some things we can do now before we've even gotten to do other things. Uh, Francis Bacon was quoted as saying, too many people develop every talent except the most vital one of all, the talent to use their talents. Willpower. I love that you're gifted. I want you to use those gifts for the Lord. Treasure. Lastly, one of the ways that you can serve with your treasures now is to be faithful in your giving. The New Testament clearly directs that the Christians are to support the local church and then have means left over because they're not consumed with the things of the world to help the poor and needy around them too. 
Some of you have been faithful from the beginning. Some of you are waiting to start. You can start today. You can give on the way out. You can give online, however you want to do that. Some of you watching online uh, may see us in this building and think, well, they got a big old building. They don't need our help. It's not ours. We're paying rent to be here. And we do need your help. A church plant is an incredible thing to start. And it's a costly thing. And God has been so good to us and so kind to us. And God will provide everything we need. And he's going to invite you to be a part of that. He's invited us to be a part of that. And it's a joy to get to do that together. When all of us invest our time and our talent and our treasure in God's work for his glory, he makes much of his church. It's an awesome thing. As uh, Aaron and the team are coming back to lead us in one final song before we're dismissed, I want to tell you about those people. You see, in Ephesians, the Bible says God has set apart some people and offices in the church for service. That's some gifts that he's given. And I want to give you some distinctives that I'm very passionate about here at Mission Bible. These leadership gifts at Mission Bible Church will look a certain way. Some of the gifts are given by God to equip the church family to do the work of ministry. Let me remind you that Mission Bible Church, how's Mission Bible Church governed? Maybe only half of you even care about this question, but it matters because it's biblical. Can I tell you? We are a Jesus-ruled church. Jesus-ruled. Where biblically qualified elders will serve the church body humbly as they lead as they instruct the flock faithfully, as they pray for the flock affectionately, as they shepherd the flock lovingly as those who must give an account for their care for the sheep. Where those elders have mutual love and concern for one another, they will pray together regularly. They will push each other toward Christ and seek to lead together as co-laborers in God's service. We'll be a Jesus-ruled church where biblically qualified deacons serve the church with enthusiasm, while striving to meet and care for the tangible needs of the body. And as God grows us and gives us staff members and ministry directors, we want our internal staff culture to reflect this as well. Listen, we want servant leaders who foster a life-giving environment that pushes us all towards spiritual help as we work with one another to serve the Lord and his bride and the community well. Here's why this matters, because when all of these things are happening, it equips the body to fulfill the Great Commission and to live out the Great Commandment in a way that you don't need a boss telling you what to do. You've got folks wearing towels, serving you from their knees as you live in a free market economy of ministry. That's the goal. That's the local church thriving. That's Mission Bible church. Let's stand together.